folks in Portland and hi folks who are on the internet with us. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, just for kicks, if you'll indulge me, if you're in the room or even if you're just at home, I invite you to stand up for just a moment and do a little shake out, maybe a little breath or a stretch, at least here in Portland. You know, it's like it's afternoon. You know, it's kind of that post lunch, you know, where's the caffeine time? So getting a little bit of blood going just might be a good thing to do. Thank you so much for all the folks who are indulging me uh, in this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so good. So, you know, Heather was going to introduce me, um, but due to our technical uh, bumps, uh, which I believe we've, you know, kind of straightened out, uh, we're running just a little late. So I'm just going to kind of go for it. Um, my name is Caroline. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Cobalt. We are an offensive security company. I'm just trying to make the mic. Okay. I started my cybersecurity career in 2005, leading information security teams at eBay and Zynga. These were super cool places to be working in cybersecurity. In both cases, we were running online operations 24 by 7 with millions of simultaneous users daily. eBay had an uptime requirement of 99.94. And as one of the first major electronic commerce shops enabled strangers to transact with each other over the internet, Zynga was growing incredibly rapidly as an early adopter of Amazon AWS. In 2009, the Zynga game Farmville launched, and in just a few weeks, the game went from zero to 10 million daily active users. A few months later, it rose to 80 million daily active users. And at Cobalt, we build security software and we do pen testing as a service, as well as other offensive security engagements. I will admit, I usually give this talk to a room full of security folks or to a Zoom full of security folks. And I suspect that today I'm actually talking to software developers and QA folks. So one of the things that I'll ask you whether you've joined me online or in person, is when you hear me talk about something, particularly cross-functional team dynamics, if what I'm describing is really different from what your experience is, I would love to learn. Um, so please don't hesitate to put your hand up either physically or virtually um, and just say, you know what, Caroline, my experience is really different because I certainly would love to learn that. Um, I have been in cybersecurity for a long time, but I've never been a QA person and I've never been a software developer. So full disclosure on where I'm coming from. And actually, anyway, we'll get there <laughs> because the whole point of this talk actually is saying that security people should be more like software development people. So we'll get there in just a moment. Um, this talk is about pen testing. Pen testing, also known as ethical hacking, also known as a team of people looking at a piece of software and trying to find vulnerabilities that can be exploited. And to open this talk, I want to tell you about the first time that I realized that most organizations who build software do not do enough pen testing. So between 2013 and 2016, I worked for a company called Sigital. Sigital has since been acquired by Synopsys. And during that time, I led more than three dozen BSIM assessments. BSIM stands for Building Security in Maturity Model, and it's a descriptive framework for real life software security. At any given point in time, there are more than 100 firms in the BSIM data pool. Um, and the data pool can be thought of as somewhat representative of all the companies in the world that operate using software, but with one pretty big caveat, which is that it costs five figures to do a BSIM. 
So if your organization can spend that much money paying a management consultant to interview your software development teams and give you a scorecard on how well you're doing software security, you're probably relatively mature and actually pretty good at it. So I think it's fair to assume that the BSIM data pool is above average compared to the rest of the world. One more kind of introductory point that I want to make about BSIM is that in security, there are lots of frameworks and standards and best practices. And the majority of these are prescriptive. They say you should do ABC. BSIM is different in that it's not prescriptive telling you what to do. It's descriptive. It's actually just like writing down what's observed. So at this point in my career, I'm flying around the world talking to teams about their software development practices. And I find out that a typical enterprise with say a thousand software applications was only doing manual pen testing on about a hundred of those applications. So that's just 10% of most enterprise application portfolios getting manual pen testing. To me, that is terrifying. Now, there are lots of reasons for this. Historically, pen testing has been kind of expensive and kind of slow. It is hard to get access to quality talent, whether you are building an in-house team or working with a third-party provider. So <laughs> there is some good news, which is that every year, my company, the company that I work for, Cobalt, <laughs> um, we do the state of pen testing research report. And in the 2021 state of pen testing report, we found out that organizations are doing way more pen testing. At that point in time, we talked to more than 600 international security folks and found out that on average, folks are actually pen testing 63% of their application portfolios. And this is great. This is a huge increase from 10% to 63%. Because, and here's where these silly graphics come in, I think that if you're responsible for 100 house plants, then it would be unacceptable to only water 10 of them. Similarly, I think that if you're in charge of caring for 100 cats, it would be unacceptable to provide food and shelter for only 10 of them. 63 is a little better but we still have room to improve. Are folks here familiar with the OWASP top 10? Yay. <laughs> All right, so the most recent version of the OWASP top 10 came out in 2021. The very first ever version of the OWASP top 10 came out in 2003. And when you put these two right next to each other, 17 years worth of time has passed in between the very first list and the most recent list, they actually look sort of startlingly alike. It's so depressing to me that they look so similar. Just to make a funny point, there's a lot of time that went by in between 2003 and 2021. In 2003, Matthew McConaughey starred in a movie called How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. For folks familiar with that very cute film, this is the love fern scene. Fast forward 17 years later to our most recent version of the OWASP top 10, Matthew McConaughey plays an animated singing koala in the movie Sing 2. Lots of time has passed, as an industry, we know how to find the most common web application security vulnerabilities. We know how to fix them and we know how to prevent them, but clearly it's not happening. And to me, this is actually just an opportunity. So I talked a little bit about how BSIM is descriptive and in cybersecurity, there are all sorts of other frameworks that are prescriptive. One of these is called NIST 853. This document, which you can see on my slide, the table of contents on the left-hand slide, is nearly 500 pages long. And I think that cybersecurity folks do ourselves a disservice with these overly lengthy documents. I actually think that sometimes these types of things make cybersecurity seem way more complicated than it actually is. 
I actually think that cybersecurity can be simple. Simple does not necessarily mean easy, but simple does mean easier to understand. So we created this model called the Modern AppSec Framework. It is super simple. There are just four things you need to do. The first thing you need to do is govern. You need to identify your assets and you need to risk rank them. The second thing you need to do is you need to find security problems. Then you need to fix those security problems and prevent those security problems. If you're interested, this picture is from an about 20 page document that we wrote called A Practitioner's Guide to Application Security. And that is available for you uh, if you wanna Google it at no cost. Um, and it is kind of our 20 page simplification of how to do application security. I wanna take a little step back and say, What's the point of cybersecurity? We're trying to manage risk. Security is about protecting value, and so much of what we value today has shifted from the physical realm to the digital realm. So value protection is really about risk management. I'm going to flash up two lists of what I call risk management objectives. These are really, why would we do cybersecurity in the first place. And this list has to do with reasons you would do it to try and impress someone else. Use cybersecurity as a competitive differentiator. Are you more secure than your competition? And is that a benefit to you? Number two, do you need to comply with something that someone else is telling you to do? Number three, do you need to achieve a defensible level of due care according to what someone probably important things to care is. Um, and finally, do you need to achieve a comparable level of cybersecurity to your peers or to your competition? I like this second list better because whereas the first list is reasons you're doing it for other people, this one is about why you would do cybersecurity for yourself. So why not do cybersecurity in order to prevent the same problems from happening over and over again? Or why not do cybersecurity in order to reduce the probability that malicious attackers can stop critical systems and applications from functioning? Or what if we required fixes for security bugs for which well-known attacks exist? There's a slightly different context in which I often talk about these risk management objectives. And that is when I am coaching security leaders on how to ask for money to invest in their programs. So a few slides ago, I showed a comparison of OWASP top 10 between 2003 and 2021. This picture is from when a group of hackers went to Congress in 1998 and they said, hey, uh, software and computer networks are insecure. 20 years later, from 1998 to 2018, those same hackers went back and they said, well, digital security is hardly any better. Joe Grant, who went by the hacker name Kingpin in his loft days said, at Loft, we tried to be the voice of reason in raising awareness for problems. Nearly all of what we said 20 years ago still holds true. Yes, there have been improvements, but the general class of problems are the same. Chris Weisopel, another one of these individuals said, back then the threat was the teenage hacker and now it's nation states. So every vulnerability got a lot more risky. 20 years ago, the threat of nation states and foreign governments with skilled hackers seems so theoretical, Weisopel said, but we all know 20 years later that this is happening constantly. So the whole point of that section is to say cybersecurity has been kind of stagnant for 20, maybe 30 years. And then this is where, where typically if I'm speaking to a security audience, I say, well, now we should go look at our brilliant colleagues who are doing software development because they're doing something great. 
And so my observation is that while the state of cybersecurity has remained fairly stagnant for 20, maybe 30 years, software development has made tremendous strides in the last 10 years. So folks may be familiar with the state of DevOps report. Uh, Puppet released the first one in 2011. By 2013, just two years later, the state of DevOps report had established the relationship between a true DevOps practice and high performance outcomes. So organizations that do DevOps report more frequent deployments, shorter lead time to change, lower change failure rates, faster mean time to recovery. If companies doing DevOps have higher performance, then naturally we want to learn about what those organizations are doing. The 2021 State of DevOps report says, security can't be an afterthought or the final step before delivery. It must be integrated throughout the software development process. To securely deliver software, security practices must evolve faster than the techniques used by malicious actors. During the 2020 SolarWinds and CodeCov software supply chain attacks, hackers covertly embedded themselves into the infrastructure of thousands of customers of those companies. Given the widespread impact of these attacks, the industry must shift from a preventive to a diagnostic approach where software teams should assume that their systems are already compromised and build security into the supply chain. It is easy to emphasize the importance of security and simply suggest that teams need to prioritize it, but actually doing so requires several changes from traditional information security methods. So, State of DevOps 2021 says, conduct a security review for all major features, invite InfoSec early and often, and use high quality documentation. So at Cobalt, one of the things that we've done is as security people, we kind of looked over and said, what are those software development people doing that is working so well? And what we observed is stuff is moving from on-prem to the cloud and you get all of these really awesome benefits, including flexibility, on-demand, scale where you need it. And so we've built our offensive security business around those principles. We took old school pen testing, which can be characterized by traditionally a consulting firm who delivers custom engagements that are billed hourly um, and who typically have a number of consultants available, but rarely on the bench because they're so busy, resulting in pretty long wait times. And we've actually built a model where we can get a manual pen test started within 48 hours. And to date, since 2016, we have delivered more than 10,000 manual pen tests around the world. So every year, so we've got so much data. We've got more than, we've got data from more than 10,000 manual pen tests since year 2016. And so every year, what we do is we take some of the data from the previous year, actually all of the data from the previous year, and we publish it. And so this year's State of Pen Testing 2023 provides data and analysis from more than 3,000 manual pen tests conducted in 2022. This pie chart demonstrates uh, the particular targets and assets upon which those pen tests were conducted. You can see that in 2022, the vast majority of pen testing that Cobalt did was having to do with web and API. Um, here is my favorite chart in the report. I invite you, if you're interested, to go ahead and look up and familiarize yourself with the whole report. You should be able to simply Google Cobalt State of Pen Testing Report 2023. Before I talk about this, I'm gonna pause for a moment and I'm gonna ask you what you think. I invite folks in person and or online to take a look at this and tell me if you can draw any conclusions. Yes, that's fine. Yes. The, uh, the access on that, which I'm 
So the axis on the left is the percentage of pen test findings that have been remediated. You know what? So in the room for folks online, the um, that's actually not clear at all. Good question. So these are percentage of fixed and then retested findings. Yes, thanks for calling that out. I'm gonna peek into the chat. Okay, all good, all good. I can wait awkwardly long. I think what stands out to me is uh, the lower the number of employees showing up. Yep. Yep. For any of the folks who were in James's session prior to mine, um, I think that you know there is this common thing about groups of humans working together and trying to get stuff done, which is to say, sometimes it's easier with a smaller group of people. And if you're going to try and do stuff with a larger group of people, you just, you actually have to change the way that you're doing it. I, I actually think there's lots of potential reasons. So this is pure data from our pen test platform. Um, and I personally have a number of hypotheses as to why. So I think that the smaller projects theory uh, is a really good one. Smaller projects, easier to fix bugs. Um, another theory that I have is that oftentimes smaller companies are newer, younger than really big companies, which tend to be older, yeah, just older. <laughs> and, and older companies have bunches of legacy software, whereas sometimes newer companies are like in the cloud and relatively easy to make changes. Um, so those are, those are a couple things. I, I've noticed too that um, in my experience, what I've observed is that smaller companies, people just know who to go to to ask for stuff. And then the relationships are such that if person A says to person B, hey, would you help me out with this thing? Person B is like, sure. And then they just do it. Um, whereas I think what I've observed in larger companies, sometimes if a security person says, hey, here's a security vulnerability, let's try and get it fixed. You know, they might spend who knows how long just trying to figure out who the business or the technical owner of that you know piece of software even is in the first place. That would be cool. I'm going to try and keep that in my head because 2024 is coming and we have an opportunity to make that report more interesting than this one. Thank you. Well, we were also, um, we're doing more code reviews. So that might actually be a data point that we could capture uh, in one of our systems automatically. Could it also be that when there's a uh, one to 50 people, uh, a good hack could wipe out the whole company and everybody loses their job, but when you've got over 1,500 people, they can easily just find somebody else to blame. That's a super good point. So one of the folks in, in the room here, just so that folks online are able to hear uh, your thoughts, has suggested that perhaps when you've got a small company and a big security vulnerability, if it goes unaddressed, that could be potentially a company ending event. Um, whereas, you know, perhaps that's less so, um, and the blame is not quite so easy to place uh, at a larger organization. Well, Thanks. I like that idea. This was fun. We should do a workshop next time where I put up every single picture in the uh, pen test report, and then we can go through them together. But this is my favorite one, so that's why I chose it. The next one's kind of a bummer. It basically says that 2022, lots of security teams were experiencing budget cuts and layoffs. And naturally, that is going to affect the state of security. So one of the, one of the, ideas is if you have fewer security resources, less security dollars, then that means that you've got 
fewer security folks to partner with development teams to assist with remediation. Um, because there is often kind of an enormous pile of work and fewer and fewer people to get that work done, then that may result in a lack of urgency when it comes to fixing the vulnerabilities. Yes, Bouchon. Why the company regarding the revenue for security? Is there any findings about that? You know, what we did was, and the way that this is displaying um, in the room, uh, just because of Zoom. Oh, there we go. So one of the things that we looked at was what does it look like in the United States versus what does it look like in the United Kingdom and Germany? And the 2022 data showed that there was a lot more activity happening in terms of layoffs and budget cuts in the United States. Um, we did not publish information, if we have it, that on the topic of budgets and uh, layoffs that are vertical uh, specific. Although the report does contain top security vulnerability types found by vertical. Thank you for that clarifying question. Heather. Yeah, you've got about uh, like six or seven minutes. All right, we're going to keep going. Thank you for the time check. Pretty close anyway. So we're, we're, we're doing not bad. Go ahead and Google state of pen testing 2023. Check out the details. Let me know what you think. Um, the next section simply says, we made a maturity model for pen testing. And the last five minutes of this talk will cover my advice on how to scale a manual pen testing program. If you're interested, another thing that you can Google is also the PTAS book, P-T-A-S. Oh gosh. Okay. One more time. PTAS, P-T-A-A-S, Pen Testing as a Service. There's a book, the PTAS book. I wrote the book. It's fun. It's got a few pages on this if you want to learn more about the pen test maturity model. How to scale pen testing. Do it faster and more often. Why does a company need a pen test? Usually it's because there's a customer who wants to see a pen test report before they buy your product. There's a regulator who wants to see a pen test report for regulatory compliance reasons. You're getting acquired and the company that's buying yours wants to know about your risk profile. You've deployed a new feature or an entirely new product and you wanna find and fix security vulnerabilities before they can be exploited by malicious actors. One way to get strategic with scaling your pen test program is to start faster. The faster you can get technical experts performing manual pen test activities, the sooner you'll have a finalized pen test report in the hands of the person who is demanding it. It also means you are that much closer to knowing about exploitable vulnerabilities in your software, and the sooner you know about them, the sooner you can fix them. And then the sooner you can start your next pen test because the product teams are just going to keep building new things. And if those new things aren't getting proper security testing, then it's possible that they are vulnerable. There is a very silly thing that I have observed in my security career. There are regulatory compliance regimes that say do defect discovery, like pen testing or scanning for vulnerabilities but then they don't actually require that you fix what you find. And so when I'm talking about scaling pen testing, I don't just mean print a PDF, give it to a regulator, check the box and move on with your day. I mean, find vulnerabilities and then fix them. Now for security people, fixing vulnerabilities involves getting other people to do things and getting other people to do things is hard. I can think of a way that doesn't work. If I get a 50 page PDF in my email and then I forward it to a bunch of engineering managers and I say, here are our pen test results, please fix the findings, that may not be effective. But you could use modern technologies like Jira and Slack to kind of package up this information and get it over to people. Um, finally, I'm just gonna kind of speed through this because we're coming to the end of today's talk. We've got this pen test data. 
using APIs allows you to do reporting on it. This has not been possible historically via traditional pen testing because pen test findings were never in a platform. They were always just in PDF reports. The last part is really fun. So we're gonna go through that part and then we'll be done. Okay, when I was six years old, the first ever ransomware attack directed users to mail $189 to a PO address in Panama. In 2022, the average ransomware payment was $4.7 million. When the first ransomware attack happened in 1989, I was six years old. This is a photo of my daughter at six years old. And when she's 40, I don't want us talking about the same types of web application security vulnerabilities that we're talking about today. I think that if we don't start turning this around right now, it's just going to get worse. I would like for the world to be a safe place for my daughter and for my grandchildren. I would like for their energy sources to be reliable, and I would like for their food processing plants to be safe and operational. I would love for computers and the internet to be a place where they can connect and create. It is time for us to do better, and I believe we can. I have tremendous hope, but no one's going to do it for us. There is no software program or machine learning that can do this for us. We have to decide what we want, and then we have to do it. It's not going to be easy, but it is simple. We just need to work together, security people and engineers, to collaboratively decide that it's important enough to get asset inventory right. We have to decide that it's important enough to update our software and install patches when software is vulnerable. We have to decide to look for security vulnerabilities that we know are exploitable and find them and fix them. This is something that we can only do together. Thank you. Have an online question you to know. Ooh, uh, a question. What are good automated tools for finding XSS vulnerabilities uh, that would be easy to implement by doing? So, Natalia, what I'll ask you to do is find me on LinkedIn and write me a message because I am not an expert in automated tools. However, I'd be happy to ask a friend who is. Um, and then and then share that with you. She's doing it already. See, Natalia, Natalia, you you already have the answer. Natalia, tell us the answer. Tell us the answer. I'm guessing just asked. Anyway, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, thanks so much.